Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you uh, for joining us today. I am Sarah Abosh Jacobson, the Barbara Rabin Chief Education Officer for the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And I'd like to thank all of you for participating in today's Lunch and Learn, the rise and fall of Dallas's Little Mexico. I'd like to start by thanking our community partners for this program. We really appreciate your support. AJC Jewish Latino Alliance, Big Brothers Big Sisters Lone Star, Christo Ray Dallas College Prep, Dallas Jewish Historical Society, Latino Cultural Center, Legacy Senior Communities, Mosaic Family Services, Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. I would also like to give a special welcome to our museum members and our board members who are joining us today. Thank you for your continued support of the museum. It's very important. Before we get started, I would like to introduce you to our guest speaker for this afternoon. Sol Viasana is a civil trial attorney with over 37 years of experience and author of Dallas's Little Mexico. He is of counsel in the White and Wiggins LLP Dallas office. Mr. Viasana has served as board member for a number of community organizations, including, and this is not, this is not the entire list, the Rockwell County Bar Association, Dallas Mexican American Historical League, Rockwell LULAC Council 22344, SMU Alumni Association, the Family Place, and Helping Hands of Rockwell County. We will leave plenty of time for questions at the end of the program. Please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen to type out and submit your questions and we will get to as many of them as we can. And now I would like to turn it over to Saul for today's presentation. Thank you very much, Sarah. I appreciate that introduction. And uh, I wanna thank the, uh, the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum for the invitation to speak today at the uh, Lunch and Learn series. I, I very much appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to talk about um, uh, Dallas's Little Mexico. It's, a, it's an area I grew up in. So I have, a, a, and my family has been, has lived there for a long, long time. And so uh, it was nice to be able to uh, do a book about it and uh, kind of capture the, what I felt was uh, the basic essence of a, of a, uh, of a, uh, of a community. A vibrant community, and and try to record that in, uh, in, a, in a small book. Um, I, I will start today by uh, just kind of just jumping in. I want to give as much time as possible to um, to, to you to uh, ask questions. And so, Phil, I need to share my screen. I think is what we need to do here at this point. All right. All right. The, um, you'll notice that first the dates, the, uh, we really began uh, as a kind of a community around the 1900s, even though they were Mexican Americans in Dallas, even from the beginning of the time, because it was a, tr uh, a, a trade route coming from the, the more, uh, uh, the more, oh, the older Mexican communities of, uh, of San Antonio and El Laredo and, and Matamor. So the, that, that also was kind of the northern end or frontier of those trade routes. Uh, this, the actual neighborhood was, uh, is, you can be seen in this little map, it uh, gives you kind of an, an, an idea where uh, things are today. Uh, actually, uh, the, the, uh, the museum itself is located kind of in an area down here, there, you know, where the old rail yards were off of Lamar uh, and Ross Avenue. And it continued on along the Katy trail line, the railroad line, Heading up this way to Maple Avenue, Fairmont, up into Cole, Carlisle, uh, and, uh, and McKinney on the north, bordered on the on the on the east, with uh, kind of even going over into the uh, the what will be the State Thomas area, the Central Expressway. But those are basically the parameters of what the of the old neighborhood were, and um, the one of the the, the driving uh, reasons that it exists is because you had a number of uh, the community began to really explode as far as population with the Mexican Revolution of 1910. Um, this is kind of an era you'll view from the 1950s, giving you an idea of what the, 
the area looked like at that time. Looking kind of to the south, you can see here the Katy Railroad lines, the old Newhoff uh, processing plant. What we hear is uh, what's still left is Pike Park, but it gives you kind of a, a small view of what would have been this area here in Mexico. Mexican Revolution of 1910, when it lasted until 1920, was a very violent revolution and it pushed a lot of of people out of Mexico, uh, again, due to the, uh, just the, the extreme violence that was going on in that country as it, as it uh, lurched toward um, uh, the, the kind of the over 30 years of despotic dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, people ready for a change. Fortunately, what happened is that um, a lot of innocent people got caught up in this long 10-year war of uh, revolution. Um, it uh, the and people who maybe who maybe one decide on one side or one decide on the other. Oftentimes, those uh, decisions were made by generals in the field, and people were being recruited and, and conscripted, right and left, and especially young boys. And um, of course, then uh, the that was something that I, I know tipped the the scales for uh, for my family when my grandparents. This is because they had young boys uh, like these like these young boys who are being uh, who are being taken away to fight as boy soldiers that they decided that it was time to leave. So in 1916, uh, along with many many thousands of other Mexicans, they crossed the river uh, Rio Grande and uh, came uh, to Texas, and so. That began a, a large exodus, a, a, a push out of that country. And people looking for, uh, actually this person right here is uh, the grandson of Garibaldi who actually came down and fought in an international brigade of, uh, of, 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 of men uh, fighting uh, in the Mexican revolutions. Uh, they came, the refugees came up from, uh, like any refugees today, any way they could get here. Uh, some by horse cart, some walk. Uh, the conditions were harsh for refugees coming up um, from Mexico. Um, there weren't a lot of refugee services available in those days. Uh, the lucky ones were able to come by train. Um, and that was important because the trains were going to be a, a very important uh, way for people to disseminate once they were, got into, into Texas. This is the old uh, Union Station in, over in what was old East Dallas. In fact, you can see some of the deep Ellen buildings over here still. This is the, basically where the Gaston Yards are now, near Baylor Hospital in Dallas. But that was the first big Union Station. It was a crossway between the, the, uh, the, uh, the Houston and Central uh, Texas Railroad and the Texas, which was went north and south from Galveston north to Dallas. Uh, came in in 19, uh, 1872, and uh, the Texas Pacific going east and west, you can see it's heading, also coming through Dallas, but it was the, the advent of the of Texas as a real, Dallas as a central kind of Texas railroad town that really began to, to see a lot of new people coming in, a lot of new businesses kind of began to come into the town. This is this building is still down in deep elements. I love, love this sign, it was the Texas and Pacific sign, um, which shows it uh, to get you to St. Louis in 23 hours. So it gives you an idea, even though it might have been slow going, it was, it was the best way to go uh, in those days. This is a great shot of the Katy, one of the Katy Railroad lines. Actually, uh, this is the Dallas Power and Light uh, coal powered plant, which is there in Little Mexico. This is what's Goat Hill, which is still there. It is actually coming out from uh, downtown. Uh, and heading out on the, its track. The track, of course, now is the beautiful Katy Trail, but uh, that gives you an idea of what uh, the northern part of the of the Mexico was looking like uh, at about 1920 or so. The neighborhood actually started as an, as an old Jewish neighborhood. Uh, uh, this is a, a Mr. Vile. He had a, um, a baking company and he lived down on Caroline Street. Uh, most of the Jewish people who came into this settled into this particular part of, uh, actually called Old Jerusalem, were um, Eastern European Jews, and uh, had many of them had come to work for the Sanger brothers, who had brought them in to, to be tailors and, and seamstresses for, um, for, for Sanger brothers' department store, and uh, it provided certain basic kind of uh, uh, 
jobs and uh, kind of community cohesion there with uh, so this early Jewish neighborhood. Uh, the Andrus grocery store over on North Pearl, the Andrus brothers, uh, the Andrus uh, family has been here a long time, uh, still here, still doing business, but this gives you a simple kind of an idea of what some of these small shops were like in uh, the uh, in, uh, in Dallas, Little Mexico. It was so much a Jewish neighborhood that actually one of the uh, the uh, a friend of mine who's now passed, uh, Mr. Luna, the Luna Tortilla Factory, the original fellow, he uh, he actually said as a boy growing up in the in the 30s, he learned Yiddish before he learned English. Actually, so in the remnants of the uh, once the Jewish community began to move out of the little Mexico area of Jerusalem, moving over to South Dallas or into the uh, kind of Cedars area too. Um, the Mexican community began taking over some of the buildings that were there. This is the actually a Primera Iglesia Bautista, the first Mexican Baptist church about 1918, 1919. Uh, and it's, uh, this is a, the school, the Sarragosa school, the part, most of the churches had, a, as, as they are today, have a school next to them. And, um, but you can see this was an actually on the old uh, synagogue tell by the, that, uh, that had been there before. And, um, by the star of David up in the, in the upper windows of the, of the school. So many of these buildings were just basically repurposed. The, uh, the biggest church in the neighborhood was the uh, Guadalupe uh, Church, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, and the shows uh, the exterior of the church, pretty simple, basic church. Um, I thought the was interesting, this is the one of the older photographs in my book, and it shows uh, a celebration in um, 1926. And when I first came across the photograph, I thought, what's well, this interesting? Well, first, it's interesting just because you can see this one, this wonderful neighborhood, and you can actually see the top of the, uh, of the, of the, the church I just showed you a moment ago, the, the old synagogue. And you can see here uh, this wonderful group of people. It was taken at Pike Park, looking a little bit to the south and maybe east. Uh, and I, what I thought was uh, must have been a JCC celebration, Texas, Mexican Independence. It turned out, actually turned out to be the uh, 4th of July celebration uh, in Pike Park in 1926. And so you begin to see, even by 1926, uh, the Mexican community here in Pike Park was going to be a central part of that community, uh, like the churches. Uh, and uh, this, it really was the kind of heartbeat of the community. Uh, had already taken, they'd already taken, quickly ad uh, adapted and adopted their new country, uh, as by seen by the flags and all through this celebration. This is a photograph from 1928. This is a day to say, it's a uh, 16th of September celebration in 1928. Uh, also at Pike Park, you can see also the, the, uh, the this is the crowning of the queen and her court, but of course, the, the, the not only the dresses and the Musicians, you can begin, you can begin to, see, to understand how uh, the park was being utilized again for a variety of things: so weddings, and quinceañeras, and these, uh, these uh, holiday, uh, special holiday celebrations like the Sais. Uh, and I mentioned the schools. This is actually the uh, the Presbyterian school um, that was existed. In, it was an old uh, Presbyterian. Uh, uh, Kind of community house and it turned it into a, uh, a church, the Presbyterian Church in New Mexico. The uh, the Methodist Church was also very involved. In fact, this is the Wesleyan Center is in the back of this, this background, but in the front here are the, the Methodist Church actually put together the first um, Boy Scout troop in Little Mexico, the Exploradores. So this is from 1938 or 39, and the first Boy Scout troop to be formed in Little Mexico. The uh, this is the uh, the uh, Emmanuel United Methodist Church it's from about 1941, 42. You can actually uh, get you an idea of the kind of small little frame structures that existed. The also too, what I like about this photograph, of course, you can see the many of the GIs who had gone off to war or get ready to go off to war uh, there in the crowd uh, at uh, the, the first uh, at the Methodist Church in, in, in uh, Mexico. Iglesia, uh, Iglesia Bautista had another home after they left the old uh, little 
building that they bought from the Jewish community. They took the little um, chalk uh, chalkboard with them. If you'll recall the first picture, but this is a, a larger building that they had over on McKinnon. Uh, the St. Anne School complex was also very important. The, the church was back over here. I showed you Guadalupe Church. This is, I think, the rectory for the nuns. It's right on McKinney. Give you an idea also what the, the streets were like. They were unpaved. They, uh, there, was, there, there was very little any kind of infrastructure there. Uh, the little uh, St. Anne School, it's a parochial Catholic school built in 1927, attached to the Guadalupe Church. Uh, that's what it kind of uh, looked like about that time. And uh, the, uh, it was going to play an important role uh, in the community as well. The many um, we weddings and funerals and all were held at the uh, Guadalupe Church. And, uh, and many kids went to this, this little parochial school. That's what St. Anne's looked like today. Uh, and I can have, I'm happy to say that um, it's on the corner there at Harry Hines, and I think it's... Um, uh, McKinnon also, or, or actually Moody. Um, and it, what, it, what happened was in 1930, or the 1999, the school, the church wanted to sell off the entire block. The, ch the property had been, uh, the church had burned. They wanted to sell the entire block. And uh, I'm, I, I was happy to work with the alumni of the school to get it landmarked before it could be torn down. And uh, that was very important to me and, and certainly to the community. So it's, it's a, it was against the wishes of the diocese who wanted to tear it down. And it was the first time we used the city's landmark ordinance against the landowner to actually landmark a property. Uh, Howard International bought the property eventually, went in and, and uh, gutted the interior, took the, the building exterior back to its original look and did an adaptive reuse. The first floor is a, St. Anne's Cafe, and the second floor actually houses uh, the, uh, the uh, Harwood International uh, Museum for uh, Asian Art. This is the rear end of the, uh, of, the, of the museum today. It has a large, one of the largest patios in the city of now, it's outdoor patios. But you can see again how adaptive use uh, of a building, uh, an old building, uh, can, be, uh, can be very, uh, can be a good thing. The, uh, the, while there were all these parochial schools, most of the kids went to public school. This is the old Crozier Tech or Dallas School. This is looking Bryan Street, looking east. Um, and you can see the school over here in the, in, the, in the other ground. This is how it looked about the time I wrote my book. It had been boarded up and looked pretty terrible. Again, was, someone came in with the right idea of an adaptive reuse, and that's the Dallas High School today. And it's a, it's a wonderful old building and has a lot of offices and uh, I think an architectural firm and other things. But the importance of trying to save some of these areas, some of these buildings, which are once and always of first importance, and now secondly, can be useful in an adaptive reuse kind of way. Another, probably the first one actually to be uh, uh, done into an adaptive reuse was the old Cumberland Hill School near the, uh, the, uh, the Fairmont Hotel. The Fairmont's right here. Uh, and, and this is what you can see. This is actually one of the earliest schools in Dallas, public schools built up on Cumberland Hill. Um, William Clements, who was governor many, many, many years ago, actually bought the building and rather than tear it down, he did an adaptive reuse and turned it into his company's headquarters. A wonderful old 1880s building, a classic little school building for that time. Now, by the 1920s, 30s, certainly the 30s, you're having like upwards to 15,000 people living in Little Mexico. And this is a great um, and uh, an example of how it had grown so much. The, the Pike Park, again, as I've talked about before, had a uh, big, uh, they should say, celebration in Tennessee. This was the program for, um, who was the, for people bought ads. And there were like over, uh, there were over 40 different businesses, uh, bowling alleys, uh, restaurants, uh, like, uh, uh, Photo photographers, uh, certainly little stores, all of them buying little ads for this uh, this this important um, celebration, one of the most important in, in Mexico. And many of the businesses you know today. This is actually the Cuellar brothers uh, in Kaufman County. Before they moved to Dallas and started El Chico, they were this is in the cotton fields of Kaufman County, and that's how they started. Till their till their mother realized that she could make more money selling tamales. Um, uh, then uh, if the coffin stayed there, then uh, been working, then the kids working in the field. So they came to Dallas and started El Chico, of course, 
was one, one of the first big restaurants. This is the first one of many. This is one over on Oak Lawn, which you get on the northern edge of downtown Dallas. The Mongada store uh, down in down kind of now where the American Airlines Center is uh, was one of the first early little stores. Uh, this is actually um, this woman over here is uh, actually Anita Martinez's mother, who was a Mongaras and before she married. Into, uh, and so you can see here, this, this is a wonderful classic little grocery store. Uh, this is La Colonial Penderia, who is a bakery are very important uh, in, in Little Mexico. There are several of them. La Colonial is probably one of the most, uh, most famous and, and, and their breads were most sought after. Oftentimes, actually, even though you had uh, little uh, grocery stores, Oftentimes would have a baker attached to the store because the bakery and was the and the bakery products is very very important. Oftentimes they would try to steal each other's bakers; they were so important. Of course, the El Phoenix Cafe is uh, is still there on the uh, down in the which now kind of uh, Woodall Rogers area. Um, the, this was started by the Martinez family in 1918. It also had a ballroom, as you'll notice. This is from about 1930s and became a, a, a focal point for a lot of um, uh, entertainment in, in, the, in the little Mexico area with dances and bands. This is the 19, actually 1940s, though it looks a lot old. 1940 picture of Harry Himes right here. Uh, you can actually see this is uh, Payne Street right across here. Another early family was my family in Little Mexico. You can actually see the Via Sana grocery store right over here with the, their, their bread truck, since they, it was important that they deliver bread. But it gives you an idea of the kind of what the place looked like. You can see in here, this over to the right is the uh, Magnolia building with the flying red horse. So you can give you a sense of we're looking kind of toward downtown. The reason this picture exists at all is because the city decided it needed to have a fast way to get from downtown to the new airport, Love Field. And to do that, they needed to obviously pave this road and do some major infrastructure. So with WPA money, federal money, they came in and decided to eventually to finally get, uh, fix up the neighborhood with streets and sidewalks and obviously a paved road so they could make, uh, so that so the community could uh, get to uh, what field. This is the Villasana grocery uh, filling station right across the street from the Villasana uh, uh, grocery store about the same time. Um, like many kind of small businesses, the, a lot of the stores and businesses would have sponsors, uh, a uh, sports team. This is the from 1937 or 38, and the Via Santa grocery store was, was sponsoring a, a baseball team. Um, Mr. Rojas over here actually went on to become a, uh, Pete Rojas went on to become a, went to play in the, in the minor leagues. The uh, another big, um, of course, entertainment was important. This is the the old uh, Pan American Theater. It actually was Dallas is called Dallas's Little Theater. It, it was the beginning of theater companies in Dallas. It was the beginning of the Dallas Theater Company. This wonderful old building. Um, Mr. Rodriguez put it put it in as a movie theater, Spanish language movie theater over on Maple. Um, this is another view of uh, working the, the infrastructure work during the 1940 on Harry Hines. You can, you can see some of the structures here that are were, 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 and how they looked. Looking over to again to the DPNL Dallas Power Light Power Plant. The Ojedas uh, family, of course, with Ojedas Restaurant started actually in the late 60s or mid 60s, and actually on the farther northern edge of, of Little Mexico, up on Maple Avenue. It was a fun, obviously, there was a fun town, I mean, a fun place. It was very insulated. Most people didn't have to go very far. In fact, even though there were other barrios or neighborhoods in West Dallas and East, Old East Dallas and Oak Cliff, the uh, Dallas's Little Mexico was the largest barrio. So people actually would come in there to do their shopping. Sp the Spanish language was, of course, very important. They could communicate with each other and, uh, and feel comfortable and not feel discriminated against. This is the, um, the field house at Pike Park as it looked in about 1915 when the city purchased it and built the, built the, uh, the field house. Uh, these retaining walls were here because of the, at that time, the Trinity River was just down here and uh, it was a deep slope there, but you can see that uh, it was a wonderful old building. Unfortunately, it got, uh, it's, they lost, they tore down, it's one of the stories here, the second story, and, it's now trying to be, we're trying to bring it back to life. The city is looking at trying to do 
some uh, renovation and do an adaptive reuse of that building so it can be used again uh, in this century like it was in the last century. There was also a strong tie to Mexico still. I mean, we had, um, uh, there was a lot of going back and forth, even though most of the people who came up, like my grandparents, realized they were not going to go back and that this was a new home. This is from about 1920. And um, this is uh, old, um, President Obregón who came and spoke in Dallas. And, and had, because again, it was a large Mexican community, he spoke. He, you notice he only, he, he was a general in the revolution. He only had one arm. See there, he lost his right arm in the revolution. He was always joked that the people that Mexico voted for him, because he only had one arm, he could steal less. So that was one of his kind of a little dark humor that General Obregón used. Um, World War II was really important. A lot of men and women served for Little Mexico. This is actually Anita Martinez's uh, older brother who was killed in France um, uh, fighting the fascists in 1944. This is uh, one of the classic little studio shots that they take that they, before they get shipped off. Julian Sal uh, uh, Saldivar was, uh, got his training as a medical doctor and was shipped off. And you see him here looking pretty happy in, uh, in the Philippines, in Manila. But unfortunately, this is just a few weeks before the Japanese took over the Philippines and uh, uh, after Pearl Harbor, 1942. And uh, unfortunately, he was captured you know, like, along with a lot of, uh, of Americans and was spent the rest of his uh, war years in Japanese prisoner of war camps. He had wanted to be a surgeon, unfortunately, because of the torture at the Japanese hands, he wasn't able to do that. But he became, came back to be one of the only two Spanish-speaking doctors in, uh, in the Dallas area. And he founded the Dallas uh, Mexican Chamber and was involved in many, many businesses and uh, quite an upstanding gentleman. My father in 1944, December, in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, Malmedy, Belgium. This is just after the Americans had taken the, the town back from the Germans um, in, uh, in December 1944. Actually, my father was, uh, was not a citizen in those days, and uh, as many of them were not, went to fight for their, for their new adapt, adopted country. He actually became a citizen in Paris, France, just a few months later, uh, toward the end of the war. The, the 1930s, the city, the community was beginning to, um, to change. Uh, you see some of the little houses, this is a large grain silo. It had always been kind of a dangerous part of town in a sense. You had the railroads, the Katy Railroads, you had the DPNL power plant, you had a dump, the city dump was there for a while. The, uh, these dangerous sort of industries like uh, like the grain elevators, uh, junkyards. So the big, the big, once the war was over, a lot of the GS came back, got their degrees, and uh, got GI bills to buy, buy new, newer homes. And what was important was they needed newer homes and larger homes rather than the the, the housing stock that, that they had grown up in. And they were also concerned about education that the schools uh, in that area were beginning to deteriorate. They were already very old. Some of I mean, my, my older sister attended Cumberland High School, which was built in 1888. And it was certainly old at the time she attended it. So they're looking at better opportunities, better for their children as far as schooling. Also the jobs are leaving this area, getting out farther into the suburbs. You see again, the Dallas Fire Light plant, the beginning of tearing down of some of those houses. Um, this is Santos Rodriguez, and I, uh, I want to kind of talk about him briefly because he's tied to Pike Park. And you recall in 1973, he was uh, only 12, 13 years old when police officers knocked on his door late at night, drug him and his brother out, took him to uh, a site of an alleged crime, which forensics later showed he had nothing to do with, and uh, trying to extract a confession from him by playing Russian roulette with him, and the officer blew his head off. Uh, that caused a, a, uh, a real earthquake in Dallas, Little Mexico, and in the community at large, because they'd always dealt with, we'd always dealt with um, a certain kind of police brutality and, and, and over-policing of our community. But this, the killing of this little boy, the murder of this boy, and the police officer was convicted of murder eventually. Uh, it just started, uh, lit a spark, lit this, it was a spark that lit uh, a powder keg. 
There was a large pr uh, protest and demonstration just a few days afterwards. Uh, the entire city came together, the black community, the, everyone came together to, to ask and demand justice for this young boy uh, and uh, who had been murdered by the police officers. Out of that grew a, a commitment to begin of finding a way to change the city. There had been up to that point a single number of districts. It was hard for anybody. At, I mean, sorry, it was at large districts, not single member districts. Uh, so it was hard for any community to, like a like Little Mexico or, or in the African American community, to elect their own people. They were put together by the the, uh, the Citizens Charter Commission and they are the Citizens Council. And difficult to get anyone to elected to represent you. Thus, Little Mexico and other neighborhoods became uh, targets for developers and uh, and some of them unscrupulous and starting to take away property and, uh, and, and cheap folks out of their property. But there came together a group called the Dirty Dozen made up of lawyers, Anita Martin, Anita Mar uh, Adolfo Callejo, Frank Hernandez, uh, Sam Moreno, uh, Trini Garza, uh, Dr. Onesimo Hernandez, uh, Pete Aguirre, uh, Joe Montemayor. There are several of them who got together, decided, well, we needed to find work for single member districts so we can elect our own people. Frank Hernandez was the first judge sworn in here by Judge Sarah T. Hughes, first Hispanic judge in the county. And, uh, and then you begin to see um, that the, the, the neighborhood begins to de deteriorate even further because of the, this land grab that was going on and folks began to buy up these properties. Um, I, uh, this was the last building. It was belonged to actually my cousin on Harry Hines Boulevard. You, if you came down Harry Hines, you probably passed it many, many times. But finally, after when Charlie died in 2018, the property was sold in 2020 and uh, the house was torn down in uh, January, 2020. It was the last house, little structure in Little Mexico. Now you, what you see is mostly this there and with some of this high rise office buildings and um, residential towers, luxury residential condos that are in there right now. This is basically the same view looking down Harry Hines that the that 1940s photograph is, but again, shows you what it looks like today looking toward downtown. You can't quite see the flying red horse anymore, but that Pike Park is over here on your right. This is the newspaper article from uh, of January, or actually it's March, 2020, where they're talking about the tearing down of the, uh, of the last buildings, the last actual business and the last house in, in Dallas, Little Mexico. This is a picture of, the, of that demolition and the types of buildings you have down there today. Pretty much what's left of uh, the uh, Via Santa grocery store. And again, that those retaining walls are still there. And again, I get a look at kind of an aerial look of kind of what it, what, what's left of kind of Dallas, Little Mexico after they've torn down most of the of all the buildings there. Now, the course, a lot has changed. We have single member districts now. We have people on, on the school board. We have people on the plan commission. We have uh, folks who are speaking on behalf of neighborhoods now that are also um, being threatened, like in West Dallas and North Oak Cliff, and trying to make sure you can kind of preserve and, and protect these, these neighborhoods, or at least find ways to do some adaptive reuse of some of the buildings, the commercial buildings in particular. Um, uh, we're gone are the days when you had a simple expressway or a Dallas tollway cutting through Little Mexico uh, or uh, I-30 cutting through uh, uh, the African-American parts of town. Uh, gone are those days. And you begin to see now people, uh, neighborhoods, organizations working, um, fighting back, and trying to preserve their neighborhoods. This is, of course, the, the Latino Cultural Center just east of downtown, which was... Uh, to show the, the importance of, the, of, uh, of, of, of Hispanic art in our city and Hispanic performing arts and visual arts. And you, you can see how even by this last census, the records or numbers are coming out right now, you know, Dallas County is over almost 41% Latino. I mentioned the Santos Rodriguez a, a little while ago and what happened to him. This is 
just in uh, 2019, the city did name the old uh, field house, which I talked about uh, earlier on, which are trying to try to do some renovation on and do an adaptive reuse for Santos Rodriguez and uh, almost 50 years after his murder. This is the unveiling of the Santos Rodriguez, the plaque at the park. Uh, I'm gonna end with this. This, after, this uh, is an, uh, Adelpha Gallejo, one of the early lawyers in town. Her statue was just unveiled at Mainstream Park uh, last month for her contributions to, uh, to the city, not only to the law, but also to, to the Hispanic community, which, uh, which she served uh, um, selfishly for many, many, many years, up until her death just a few years ago. That's the uh, end of my presentation. I want to allow some uh, uh, questions so I can uh, kind of get to get to them and try to kind of clarify or, or expound a little bit more on, on the community and uh, what it meant to me and what it meant to many other people. Um, Saul, can you stop sharing your screen so we can... There we go, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I have uh, several questions have come in. Um, the first question is, somebody wants to know, why did the Catholic Church want St. Anne's destroyed? The, uh, their, their, uh, their stated reason was that they had a lot of bad priest bills to pay. And um, they had been hit with some pretty serious lawsuits for uh, the uh, horrible actions of some of their priests. Uh, that was the stated reason. Uh, I think basically they just wanted to make uh, it was the, the 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 area that entire block was worth a lot of money. It's not as if they didn't have other properties they could sell. They did, um, and it could have sold to pay off their their debts, their legal debts. But that was primarily the, 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 the reason that the, all that was left was the little school, the church already burned down, the rectory was gone. So they had a, a block of prime real estate, they wanted the money. Um, could you talk a little bit about the process of immigrating to Texas and what it was like for Mexican refugees around the turn of the century? So, you know, 1910 to 20, um, versus how it differs from today. Uh, did people who wanted to come, did they simply cross the border? Did they have to apply for asylum? How did it work? No, oh, they, they just crossed the border. My, my, my father and his family, they put a, a nickel in the turnstile at the bridge on Laredo and walked across. And uh, they had to do a manifest where they were and this, that, and the other. And they did um, go to San Antonio, which was the big consulate at that time, Mexican consulate in Texas. And uh, you know, have have some papers worked up, but they didn't they didn't have to apply for anything or, or anything like that. The uh, of course at that time, the United States, um, a lot all these refugee issues and uh, and matters of uh, of who we let in and border issues is oftentimes driven by it's driven by the economy. During World War One, we needed more people coming in to work because the, our guys were off fighting in Europe and. Uh, and uh, same thing in World War II, and so you'll see a lot of the these new these uh, these pro these programs like the Bracero program in World War II. We needed agricultural workers, so we welcome those those people to come in from Mexico. When the war is over, we don't need them anymore. We ship them off or deport them. So those uh, those uh, restrictions on immigration are much more recent. They're driven more by um, they're driven initially by just the fact that they. We need, we need workers and we don't need workers. And, uh, and of course, it kind of, there are, there's the, there's the xenophobia. There is a, there's always a sort of the racial issue you know, and the kind of a fear of the other, I mean, obviously people speaking Spanish or another language, or maybe they have a different religion. They're going to be um, in Texas anyway, they're still kind of look, look, uh, looked on with suspicion. But all the new kind of uh, convoluted uh, immigration laws really only come into play much later. Uh, and, uh, particularly with the Reagan administration, we get the first big kind of uh, immigration um, reform laws, trying to pull all these disparate laws together to make some sort of sense. And of course, we're still in the middle of that now. Um, 
Another question. Uh, this is uh, from one of one of the our participants, and she'd like to know if there's a memorial in Dallas finally being planned for uh, Santos Rodriguez after all of these years. And and if so, could you tell tell us a little bit about it? Well, the field house, as I said, of Old Pike Park has been named for him as of uh, 2019. The uh, they, of course, the field house is going to take a lot of renovation. You know, they're going, to, they're going to take some money to put it back to its original 1915 uh, look. And of course, it's going to have to serve a different purpose. The good thing about the area now known as Little Mexico uh, is, uh, is there are a lot of people living down there now. They're, you know, they're not they're uh, they're living in those high rise condos. They're walking with the dogs. They like Pike Park. I'm sure that I see people, uh, uh, you know, playing over there uh, all the time. But it's going to take it uh, being brought back. It's going to take city money and, and other money to bring the old field house back to some sort of uh, usable condition. So I I suspect there is a there is a move now to once the the uh, the field house is completed, once the the park is uh, renovated with you know, landscaping on. It's only about five acres. It's not a big park, but it's a good clean and you know, solid urban park. Once that happens, there'll probably be a move to not only have um, the, uh, the field house named for him, but maybe maybe name the entire park for him. There's also going to be a statue that's going to be placed in uh, Pike Park uh, of Santos, probably within the year, you know, probably less than a year. Um, this is uh, from that same questioner. Um, they, they said, on a personal no, did you go to Ed Walker? And the reason they're asking is that they went to middle school with some via sonnets. Uh, no, I, I went, my, my school was the, was a little, uh, I went to public school. So I went to Sam Houston Elementary School, which is still there. It's celebrating its like 120th year, I think, or something like an old school, uh, and to North Dallas High School, which is still I think. Okay. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, participant would like to know uh, if you know, did redlining play a role in how the community became gentrified uh, in the Little Mexico area? The, uh, again, back in the time, um, well, these were small, these were all small properties right? when the Little Mexico started back in the 19 teens and 1920s. Uh, small homes, small little properties. Uh, a lot of it was rental property. Uh, uh, but it began to be bought up by some of the Hispanic families. Um, but again, there was no real protection against, uh, it was, there, nobody, there was no bank down there. Nobody was lending money to, to the Mexican community. Oftentimes people would borrow money in, 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 the, in the shop, in the grocery store from, the, from, their, from their neighbors. Those were the banking. It was all a, basically an underground banking situation. So no one was lending any kind of money to, uh, to the, the, the businesses or the residents for their properties in Little Mexico. And they were able to be snatched up at such reduced prices. What would happen is some developer would go in and buy a block, a block of, uh, uh, of, of blocks and then go down to City Hall the next day and get them zone commercial, which was, of course, much more valuable at that point. That's how, it was, that's how Little Mexico got bought up and, and destroyed. Like I said, neighborhood organizations now are much more are fighting back against that. I mean, I've worked with some over in West Dallas, for instance, that are doing, if a developer wants to do a, a development, they we want to protect that neighborhood. So we might put together a community benefits agreement, basically a, a contract with the developer saying, if you're going to put this kind of building in, we want uh, a, maybe a clinic, we want a grocery store, we want, we want some of the amenities that our neighborhood has long sought and city to do, so you as a developer, when you come in, that's, that's, the, that's the deal. So uh, those, and then of course, you, as I said earlier, you have people at City Hall now, on council, on a planning commission, who are Hispanic. So they do now have people, the, the Latino community uh, does have people to go to now and work with on trying to prevent uh, this kind of uh, eradication of entire Okay. Um, this question is at, at the height of Little Mexico, did most people in the neighborhood work and live in the community or did they branch out and work downtown or in surrounding neighborhoods? The, uh, it's a good question. They, they, again, that people try to work where they, where they uh, near their jobs. 
So a lot of folks work downtown, but remember downtown and the folks who are right kind of together. Uh, many work a little bit farther north uh, in some of the uh, some of the agricultural areas. In fact, up now we're kind of Parkland Hospital and uh, the old St. Paul Hospital on Harry Ice. Those were large uh, pecan orchards up there. So a lot of the people would, would have to get rides to work up in the in the agricultural areas there. So, but most people lived and worked either in New Mexico or very very much on the on the edges of New Mexico. It's so part of the decline was after the war, World War II, where you have more of the jobs outside of the downtown area and more in the suburbs, things like that, caused by the, the war economy plants that kind of proliferated in Grand Prairie, uh, Garland, and places of that nature. So you had, yes, the jobs begin to leave, so the people begin to leave. And certainly the schools had already deteriorated. Okay, so this is a follow up on that question. Um, this is from 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 an, another uh, audience member. Um, he would like to know what were the most typical types of jobs uh, that community members who actually lived in Little Mexico took, and how did they change over the years? And you've mentioned war work and some of the other things, but if you could dig into that just a little bit more. Well, but there were a few uh, institutional um, uh, employers. Uh, I mentioned Parkland Hospital. Parkland, the, the old old Parkland out the Woodlawn over on Maple Avenue at Oak Lawn, um, uh, which has also had an adaptive reuse, uh, beautiful building. Um, a lot of folks got a steady paycheck working there or working at, at Saint, the old St. Paul's Hospital over in Bra on Bryan, kind of Bryan Place there, just east of downtown. So those were steady jobs and uh, a lot of people worked at those places. Uh, you had some involved, of course, with the churches uh, who were uh, there in the community. Um, the, those were the, many were were a lot were our entrepreneurs, like my family, who had different various businesses and they were working in the community. The entrepreneur, the, uh, you'll find at that times that the entrepreneurial class with uh, new immigrants is very very high, and so they'll take over a little grocery store and they'll um, you know, they'll make it work. Or they'll take over a filling station and make it work. So, and then of course, you have to say you had the agricultural workers who were working more on the peripheral of of, uh, of uh, little Mexico, but nevertheless uh, contributing mightily to it. But there were only a there were only a few institutional um, uh, steady kind of jobs that you could have. A lot of them worked for the railroads, which brought them into the into the area. Okay. Of course, it all changed again at the beginning of the, after the war. Okay. Um, this question, uh, it's a two part. Um, why is it called Pikes Park? And as I guess as part of that, was there a connection between Little Mexico and its residents and the Jewish community? Uh, or does that, does that go away when, when the Latinos move in and, and the Jews begin to move out of the area? Uh, it's called Pike Park is his name for a fellow uh, Edgar Park who was on the uh, on the park board in the 1920s or 30s. So interestingly, uh, it kind of a, to, which kind of segues into your let's start, second part of your question, Pike was related uh, to the Sangers. He married into the Sanger family, and so um, uh, so there was a connection uh, always with the Jewish people. So I said, Mr. Luna learned Yiddish before he learned uh, you know learned English. Uh, in the community, many of the, the last stores that were down there, the last businesses, were some of the Jewish the Jewish uh, uh, community stores. But um, uh, so I certainly still have, an, I think, an affinity for many of the, the Jews that I grew up around. But the, the because of the dispersal, not only of the Hispanic community but of the Jewish community in the city throughout the throughout the city, like the like, like the Latinos have, that that's doesn't. Uh, that probably hasn't been as, as reinforced over the last few years as it, as it certainly was early on when uh, the Jew Jewish life in, uh, in Little Mexico and, and the Mexican-American life in the Mexican old world very clearly entwined. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this uh, this uh, audience member would like to know uh, if you could uh, let us know what or which Latino landmarks around town currently are most in danger? Um, and if you have any suggestions for things that, that we can do to help? Well, uh, 
Pike Park still wor I worry about. I mean, it's five acres in the middle of a very hot real estate area is still a concern. It's harder for a developer to come in and buy a park, or it's harder for, I should say, for a city to, to the annex and sell a park, but it can be done. Uh, probably the old housing project, the Little Mexico Village, which is right next to the park, which belongs to the Dallas Housing Authority, that's probably got a big target on its back. And, uh, and it's been there since the 40s, because again, housing was an issue during the war and after the war in particular. And so uh, that, that piece of property is probably uh, um, uh, ripe for being uh, sought after by developers. Um, there, the, um, there are parts of, uh, of West Dallas, uh, La Pajada, and, uh, Los Altos, those areas over there right across the river to the west downtown that are in serious, uh, uh, serious jeopardy by developers. Um, and, and again, uh, there's some been some pushback by those communities who are waiting to work out some contracts with developers like a community benefits agreement. But uh, they are, they're still in, 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 uh, in jeopardy because uh, obviously the, uh, the easiest thing to do is just to buy them and tear down those homes and make, those, make people move away. Uh, even though they've lived there for generations. So I, I see some concerns there. Also in a little bit in North Oak Cliff, uh, the same thing. Once these, once these, when I saw Little Mexico really die was when they, there, was a place, there was no place to park anymore. Even if you had a church, uh, like my old church who was there, it had to eventually leave this parking drives up. There's no real way, there, there's, no, there's no way to actually get there and park even if you want to. Uh, so begin the, the whole beginning, the way the traffic is, is, is arranged, the way the traffic signals are arranged, the way uh, uh, highways are pushed through, like uh, interstates or toll roads, uh, those things can really begin to, to truly dismantle uh, the neighborhood. And right now, those are the ones, those are the neighborhoods I fear most for. Okay. Um are there organizations that you can suggest that people in the audience get involved with to help? And what would they be? Well, the Dallas Mexican American Historical League is probably the one that knows best uh, about the life and death and, and uh, of many of these neighborhoods and the ones that are still viable, they certainly have ties to like West Dallas and North Oak Cliff. But uh, so that's an important one uh, because it's not just the history, it's trying to, to make the history alive today still and preserve some of that history for that group. Uh, some organizations like in uh, neighborhood associations, especially like in West Dallas, like the uh, La Bajada neighbors, there are, there are several, uh, some of the community groups over there, they're, they're also very important to try to stay in contact with. And, uh, and uh, it's because their goal is always to try to preserve and, uh, their communities as much as possible with the understanding there's always gonna be some transition. Okay. Um, what I would ask, um, Caroline, uh, would you um, get uh, the, the names and contact information for those two organizations after today uh, from Seoul so we can send those out to uh, the people who were part of this program today so that they can make those, those connections if they would like to themselves. Um, that was the last uh, question. It was a, a very nice set of questions. And I wanted to thank you, Saul, so much for, for sharing just really an incredible series of, of photographs of, of, of the history of, of, a, of a really vibrant community with us um, and bringing us really up to date on, on what that community uh, was and where that community is today. Um, and I would like to thank everybody for having joined us this afternoon for this uh, Lunch and Learn, and we hope to see you again at another one in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.